Welcome to Beyond the Coverage, I'm Chris Horner, and today's edition, of course, I gotta cover Matthew Vanderpool and whether or not if he's moved up a position on my number one page for Beyond the Coverage and the Butterfly Effect. I only have six writers on the top page. Tade Pogacar, Jonas, Primoz Roglic, Remco Evnepoel, the big guy, Wal Van Aert, and of course, number six, Matthew Vanderpool. Where is he at after Perry Roubaix? Well, he's still number six, guys. I'm sorry, you can't win Perry Roubaix and win under the style and the conditions that I saw him win, everybody's like, he's 59.6 kilometers solo. Chris, what more do you want? Okay, when I look at the race and I dissect it, there's no Wow Van Art there. I told you guys on the Butterfly Effect, Visma Lisa Bikes missing basically half their team, if not 100% of their team. They're bringing in guys that were, weren't even supposed to start here at Perry roubaix and they're in the front group. So when I look at the conditions of the race, I can't bump Matthew Vanderpool up over the big guy, Wout Van Aert. I'm certainly not going to bump him up over Rimco. I'm not going to bump him up over Primoz Roglic. I can't bump him up over Jonas. Jonas might be the number one rider on the Butterfly Effect and beyond the coverage. But Tade Pogacar is my number one because he wins one-day races. He's got two Tour de France victories. He's winning week-long races all over the place. He's doing 81-kilometer solo breaks. So how can I give... Matthew Vanderpool bump him up after Perry Roubaix because in my realm, I see it the way it is, guys. And I try not to get emotional about it. I try not to look at Perry Roubaix and go, wow, he devastated everyone. His team was fantastic. I look at Perry Roubaix and I see exactly what he had to deal with. The temperatures were perfect. 18 Celsius, about 65 Fahrenheit. That is the absolute, I, I, perfect, perfect, ideal scenario for a big guy. If you're a small guy like me, you want it to be 105. I don't care if it's 105 out because the big guys like Matthew Vanderpool, when you hit the climbs, they start to suffer more, they sweat more, they create more heat. When it's 65, 18 Celsius, that's an ideal scenario for a big guy the size of Matthew Vanderpool. If you take him into LBL, which he has on his schedule coming, if it's 65 degrees out, you better look out. He might win LBL. I don't doubt that at all. But if you told me it was going to be 90 degrees or even the high 80s, I'd tell you Matthew Vanderpool is going to suffer at LBL, and I don't think he's going to win because he's not going to be used to that kind of heat. And because he's a bigger guy, he produces more energy. More energy, more watts, more power on the pedal produces more heat. All you got to do is look at that diesel truck going down the freeway and see that that guy's engine is definitely going to run hotter than your little four-cylinder car. It's the same scenario. It's always like that. So let's dissect Perry Roubaix a little bit so that I can give you guys the facts so you don't get all like lost up in that 59.6 kilometer solo effort at the finish. First off, when you're looking at all the interviews, it doesn't look like there's much wind when they're in the starting area when they're getting the pre-interviews done before the race starts. But when we get out on the course, it's the long section before we hit the first cobblestone section with 29 sectors to go. So that whole section there, about 100K, that's all tailwind. When you're pushing the tailwind at the front, you look at Albacine de Kunic at the front, they're going about as fast as the bikes can go. Eventually, you just run out of gears, and that's as fast as you can go. But because it's a tailwind, everybody behind Albacine de Kunic, those guys aren't saving as much energy as they would be if there was no wind or... If there was a headwind, they would save even more energy. So Albacine de Kunic's going fast. When you go faster for, through the first 100 kilometers, you shorten that distance too. So say, say you save 15 minutes, whatever it is. I don't know, 15, maybe it's 20 minutes. Whatever it is over the 100 kilometers before you hit sector 29, they're saving time right there by riding the front. And everybody that's behind the front group, of this is Albacine de Kunic, and there the peloton's going down like that. Everybody back here, is not saving the kind of watts they would if there was anything other than, of course, a tailwind pushing them. If there's a headwind, they save more energy. If there's no energy, if there's no wind, they save more energy. If there's a crosswind, they're gonna use more energy up than a tailwind, but the tailwind is certainly nothing like having a headwind. So Albacine de Kunic's gonna save 10, 15 minutes, whatever it is for the 100K, because the tailwind's so fast and the speeds are so high. That means they've been on the front less time when they hit sector 29. We see them get on sector 29. It looks like it's still a tailwind at the start. Then they're going to hit a left turn. It's going to be a hard left turn, which means there has to be wind somewhere. 
So once they make the left, we start seeing the echelons come into play. Matthew Vanderpool is in perfect, perfect position with his Albacine de Kunic guys at the front, and he's in the echelon. When you see him in the echelon, that means the back of the peloton, those guys are going to start suffering, and that's why we see the race already blowing up on sector 29, then again later on sector 28, where we saw Christophe Laporte coming out the back on those first two sectors, and then his teammate Afini's coming out the back with him. They're suffering. They haven't saved a ton of energy with the tailwind because of the speeds. Now they get into the crosswinds. We know Christophe Laporte's been sick throughout the whole season. He has every right to drop out the back. Every time when I was first over racing with Frances de Jure, and I was doing the big time classics, when there was crosswinds, I'm dropped early in the race. If there's headwind, I might be there for sure late, deep in, 200, 225 kilometers into a monument race because there's no wind there. I get a better draft. I could recover better. I was a young kid, didn't know what I was doing. I was a big time knucklehead when I was riding with Frances de Jure. And so if the conditions were right, I could get deeper into the race. But if you have a crosswind, like we start seeing on sector 29, 28, and throughout every time they're making a left and right turn on Perry Roubaix, Matthew Vanderpool is saving massive energy. And his teammates, every time whoever second, third, fourth, and fifth, I know second and third is probably going to rotate because they're using Sylvain Dillier up there often. Oscar Rizabek's riding early, of course, for Albacine de Kunic. And then they're going to save Johnny. Johnny Vermesh until later in the race, but those first two guys for Albacine de Kunic, yes, they're rotating at the front, but everybody that's out of the echelon is going to be suffering back there, taking a lot more wind than you normally would be. So you got tailwind to begin with, crosswinds right away on sector 29, 28. You got ideal weather conditions for a big guy like Matthew Vanderpool. He was the best guy on the first page, the only guy on the first page out of my six favorites on Beyond the Coverage and the Butterfly Effect. He's the only guy on that page, and the other five aren't here. Then when we look at stage at the second page, really there's Mads Pedersen on the second page. Maybe, maybe you can throw in Jasper Philipson in there on the second page with Mads Pedersen, but I'm not willing to do that right now. Jasper Philipson, even though he won Milan San Remo, he's got to go a little bit deeper into the races, spend a little bit more time on the win before I'm going to put Jasper Philipson there with Mads Pedersen. If it was going to be 100% field sprinters that I'm talking about, Jasper Philipson, you're on the first page. You're on the first page top of the list. You are one of, if not the best sprinter in the European peloton. That's how much I can appreciate Jasper Philipson's ability. But at the moment for the one day classics, until you can get on the front and start riding in the wind left and right like we see Mads Pedersen, Mads Pedersen at Perry roubaix is the only rider on the second page period. There's nobody else. Not even one single rider from Visma Lisa Bike makes the second page with Mads. Not one person from Pseudo Quickstep. The whole wolf pack does not make the second page there with Mads Pedersen. So when you look at everybody, Maybe you can look at a Niels Paulette and say, wow, Niels Paulette, he was riding pretty good at Flanders. He got on the podium after the disqualification from Michael Matthews, who went hard from the left to the right. But still, I don't put Niels Paulette on the second page. So when I break everything down and continue to break it down as we get further into the race, Albacine de Kunic, amazing job, head and shoulders above what I thought they could do, especially at Tour of Flanders. Now here at Perry roubaix each one of their riders went deep into the race. The only hope when I was watching it live, Perry Roubaix that is, when I was turned it on because I was up at about 4 a.m. in the morning, so they're at about 160 kilometers to go into the race and they're hitting the first cobblestone sections. When I turned it on and I saw right away the devastations after sector 29 and 28 with the crosswinds happening, the only thing I hoped for after that is that there's some flat tires and there's some mechanicals and some bad luck. Now a lot of people talk about luck at Perry Roubaix. There is a ton of luck needed. But again, another thing that's playing into Matthew Vanderpool's position here to be able to just dominate Perry Roubaix, outside of the crosswind, outside of his team being great, the weather, outside of the cobblestones, when we're talking about luck, everyone says, ah, oh, he's got to have luck. No, he doesn't need luck. His team's the first team on the front. When they're in the echelons, it's even easier in the echelons on the cobblestones because you can see what's coming and because... Matthew Vanderpool's form so good, he's thinking better, right? He's seeing everything. The guys in the back who are redlined, when I first went over again with FDJ and I was doing the European races, I couldn't see what was coming up. 
I would have to listen to the whistles coming up at the classic monument races when you're coming into those Belgium towns and they have those big planter bushes that are slowing down the traffic that make you weave left and weave back, weave back right. I couldn't even see that coming. How would I be able to see something coming at Perry roubaix that's on the cobbles? You're never seeing it. So the riders in the back are flatting more, they're crashing more than Matthew Vanderpool because he's at the front. He's thinking incredibly, incredibly straight. He's seeing everything. He's thinking fabulous. Again, when I was with FDJ, I would listen to the whistles because that was the only thing that I, my head would be down. I'd be twisted. We're going in the crosswind sections like this. We're coming up to a town. My eyes could barely keep them open. I was hurting so much. I'm on the edge of my saddle with my saddle going up into my butt basically because I'm hurting so bad. And I'd hear that whistle and I'd be like, okay, if you hear the whistle, you got to look up. I'd look up and I'd, we'd move hard to the left or right to dodge a planter that was taking up half the road that is four feet high. And I was having problems seeing that. So everyone at Perry roubaix that's behind Matthew Vanderpool and Albacine de Kunick are experiencing that kind of Perry roubaix especially the young kids that have done it for the first time. They haven't memorized the course at all. They're in big time problems. If you're new and you're going to be in the back, you've got to run a little bit more tire pressure than Matthew Vanderpool too because you're not going to be able to see anything. And if we look at Matthew Vanderpool when he's going solo with... <laughs> 59.6 kilometers to go. You can even see as he's going through some of the corners where he knows not to drop all the way to the inside. He knows to go enough to the inside to catch the smooth part where the cobbles are still patched together, but miss the holes. He was doing that in the last 60 kilometers when he's full gas, 100%, and he's got Mads Pedersen, Niels Paulette, his teammate Jasper Philipson, and two FDJ riders, Stefan Kuhn and Pithy, who can't bring back any time on him. So, again, that's why I can't move up Matthew Vanderpool up to fifth spot and bring him over the big guy, Wal Van Art. We're going to have to wait and see how Matthew Vanderpool does when he gets into the, the deeper classics here because he's got on his schedule. He's going to do Amstel. He's won Amstel in the past. But it's going to be interesting to see how he does there and then how he does when he gets over to Liege, best on Liege, and he has to ride against Tade Pekacar and Primoz Roglic. That'll be a different story. Now, again, I still need to wait and see. The big guy, Wal Van Aert, he's still recovering from that crash that he had in the Classics. So I'm not ready to bump Matthew Vanderpool over Wal Van Aert right now. It's not going to happen because I'm a realistic. When I look again at Perry Roubaix, the conditions were perfect. And then, of course, when Matthew Vanderpool does throw in his solo attack, at sections, the, cross, the tailwind is so good that once you've been going hard on the front, and you have that, that tailwind pushing, pushing you from behind, go out there and ride in a big tailwind. Go out there and do 50K an hour. When you back off the pedals at 50K an hour and there's no tailwind, your speed drops immediately. That means you're pushing hard to keep that 50 kilometers an hour speed. But when you have a tailwind, you can do 50 kilometers an hour. You can max the speed out of the bike and the group behind, they're still not getting that kind of draft that they're getting that I talked about in the first 100K. It's not a fantastic draft behind Mads Pedersen if it's a tailwind. It's not a fantastic draft for Niels Paulette, Jasper Philipson, for the two FDJ riders behind Mads Pedersen if there's a crosswind. So that's why we see the gap always going out to Matthew Vanderpool. Now, let's say he goes into LBL. Let's say it's 90 degrees out. Let's say Primoz Roglic arrives at LBL with the kind of form that we saw the Slovenian at Tour of the Basque Country. He crashed twice there at Tour of Basque Country, so I need to see where his form is when we get in there. Now, if he can drop Primoz Roglic, and let's say it's in the high 80s and 90s or something like that, and he's going up those, those bergs in Stavolo, and he's able to drop Primoz Roglic. Let's say he's able to solo with Tadej Pogacar back there. That, that can start bumping him up. But I need to see Tadej Pogacar on form. He's always on form, so he will be. But he needs to not crash at LBL. I need to see that Primoz Roglic has recovered from his two crashes. And then maybe there's some hope for Matthew Vanderpool to jump up to fifth on my list. But right now, when it comes to Wout Van Aert and Matthew Vanderpool jumping up over Remco Evnepoel, there could be a little hope, but I seriously doubt it because what I saw out of Remco Evnepoel there at the Basque Country, he might have even jumped up a whole nother level when you see him crash in the first day time trial and then still finish in the top 10 just a few seconds off of Primoz Roglic who went right, did a U-turn, made another right, only guy to make two right turns on the time trial course that didn't exist and still win the race. You can't jump over guys like that if the only races that Matthew Vanderpool can win are flat, slightly smaller hills 
and perfect weather conditions, and of course, has a fantastic team looking after him the whole time. I might have a different story for you or a different take on Perry Roubaix if Matthew Vanderpool's Albacene de Kunick team had just, let's say they exploded after the Sector 29, Sector 28, Sector 27. Let's say they exploded and he was left with just one teammate looking after him or two teammates looking after him once they got out of the Ehrenberg Forest where Mads had so much problems and he only had one teammate left. Even when we got out of the forest, after Matthew Vanderpool had a fantastic ride all the way up to the forest, he gets out, he still has Jasper Phillips in, he still has Johnny Vermesh who haven't even touched the front. And I know for sure that Mads Pedersen's teammates, he used all except for one when he was off the back with about 160 to 140 kilometers to go. That was most of his team. Once he got in the forest, he was really lucky to have Vasek there to do the big time pulling after he flatted to get him back up, but that was used in energy. Matthew Vanderpool, even when you look at his Perry Roubaix, the guy didn't even flat. I mean, he didn't even have any bad luck. And he didn't have bad luck because he is that good, because he does think that good, because his team had him in the right position to be able to see things better. So. When I look at Perry Roubaix, when it's all said and done, Matthew Vanderpool was spectacular. Don't ever forget that. That's why he's top six on the first page on my listing up here on Beyond the Covers. But is he ready to go top five? Not under these conditions. Perry Roubaix was perfect. His team was perfect. The weather was perfect. Matthew Vanderpool's ability to ride the cobblestones is perfect. There's no way I can move him over Wout Van Aert. It's not going to happen. Not just from that. I'm going to need a lot more racing. And remember, if you're on the top six, on the butterfly effect, you got to at least be racing some of these guys from the top five that are ahead of you if you're six. And for me, in order to bump you over, that didn't happen. That's why he's still six. But there's still hope. There's big races coming. Matthew Vanderpool's racing. And I'm still gold. And Liege bests on Liege. And he's going to have to go against Liege bests on Liege, Tade Pogacar, and Primoz Roglic. So like and subscribe because you know the butterfly effect is coming and it's going to be exciting. The classics are just around the corner for the GC guys to mix with the classic riders, then we find out who's the best. Because remember, when we're talking Perry Roubaix and Flanders, the GC guys weren't even there. And we all know Tadej Bogacar can win the flat races too. That's why he's number one. So make sure you like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys real soon.